We come to prayer with me, please. Gracious, loving God, as this is the day that you have made, and we are thankful for what you provide in our lives each and every moment. Allow us to continue our gratitude to those in our lives, and even those that we may not even know. Allow us this morning, gracious God, to praise and honor you this morning as we keep our vision and mission growing, and as we strive to keep the generosity in our midst alive. Allow us to continue to come together with one another and through the love you provide to each and every one of us. So I ask now that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day and the words that come from my mouth, along with the meditations on each and all of our hearts. May they be acceptable to you in the name of Christ in whom we pray. Amen. Amen. There is so much that I love about this time of year and about fall, but at the same time, probably like the rest of you, I wasn't quite ready for the sudden drop in temperature last week of the 70s and 80s to the low 30s this morning. It's like we kind of skipped fall altogether and went right into winter, but as you all tell me, that's the Midwest for you, right? So now there was this family somewhere in Utah who were out for a night of family fun. And they decided to have a family outing to the town's corn maze. And I'm not sure how long it took them to maneuver this maze once they were there, but I can share, I know how long it took them to realize that they left their three-year-old son behind in the maze. And to add to that discovery, that this realization didn't happen until the following morning, 12 hours later. Realizing this, the parents called the local police station and reported that they accidentally left their child in the corn maze overnight. And according to the story that's been told, and thankfully the child was found shortly after he was lost, all was well and taken care of, and he was taken care of through the night. I mean, can you imagine, because I certainly can not being a parent, but losing your child like that and not realizing until 12 hours later that what in the world were you doing not to realize that you lost your child and it was 12 hours later. And I don't know if you've ever been lost or left behind or on the other side of it, but leaving someone behind, and I'm sure it can be a pretty disturbing feeling, but I shared the story as we get on in our message this morning and as we continue our series of our DNA where we have been talking about the stuff the church is made of and about what makes us. What is our identity? What is the DNA of this particular church? And over the past few weeks, we have focused on our vision as a church also and how we are in the world and how we do business so to speak but developing those lifelong followers of Jesus because that's why we exist and in order to carry out that vision that years back was developed that our mission statement came from a lot of that and if you've forgotten what our mission statement is all about, you can see it over the, the doorway as you come into the entrance of the church outside. But just as a reminder, our mission for this church is to minister, ministering God's will. We magnify God's dominion. We celebrate God's love. And we cherish God's people. And those are the ways in which we are going to develop this lifelong following and being followers of Jesus, of which today we're going to be celebrating God's love through loving the lost. We're going to look at what it looks like as well as how Jesus loved the lost. Well, we point to one example we find in Scripture of how Jesus did that, of which we should consider how Jesus cared for those people and how he loved those who were lost. There are three things that we're going to need to do in order to be able to do this, 
to be able to carry on our mission as a church and loving the lost. The first thing we need to do in order of loving the lost would be that we need to recognize that these folks are missing. And I'm sure that sounds like it's the obvious, but it's important that we understand that it starts here with us. Because we as a church and we as individual followers of Jesus, that we can do something and sometimes get distance and we don't even think about those people who are actually lost the people who are missing. And I think we forget and leave folks behind, and you can laugh with me as you will, but we get distracted and we're taking in everything else around us, and we're caught up in our own lives, we're caught up in the business of the church, and we fail to stop and realize that there are people around us that are lost. So if we're going to love the lost, it has to start with us recognizing that they are lost in the first place. And it starts with looking around and asking, who are those people? Who are those people that we cross paths with on a regular basis who don't know Jesus? Because we have to recognize that, we have to recognize that there are people who are missing from the church. And there are people who are ultimately missing from heaven with us at the same time, apart from that saving relationship that we have with Jesus, and that we know that in God's heart, that God says that none should be lost. One of the examples Jesus shares is through the parable in Matthew 18. There was so many verses, so many scriptures that I um, utilized for this sermon, I couldn't like do them all this morning in our scripture readings, but one of them is through the parable of Matthew, and it says that suppose a shepherd had a hundred sheep, and one of them strays away. Won't the sheep, won't the shepherd leave the ninety-nine on the hillside and go search for the stray? If the shepherd finds it, the truth is there is more joy over the one found than over the ninety-nine that didn't stray. And in the same way, it never will be our God in heaven that is the ones, the little ones, should not be lost. So in God's heart, none would be lost. And none should perish. But apart from Jesus, that's exactly what will happen. And I'm sure it's not a comfortable thought. I mean, think about those who are lost. And they didn't come into a relationship with Jesus. They didn't even have that and they now will be separated for the eternity. As we heard a few weeks back, Jesus was telling us that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to God except through me. Jesus is saying that I am the only one, and the truth, and the life, and the people that are all around us who have yet to enter into that relationship with God won't do so unless they come through him. So I asked you this morning, have we forgotten about those people? But it takes more than just recognition. It takes more than just understanding that those who are lost, which leads us to the next reason in order to love those lost, these people have to matter to us. And that may sound simple as well, but we only care about things that are lost. And if it actually matters to us, and if it doesn't matter to us, then it probably doesn't matter then if they are lost or not. Unfortunately, it can be easy to develop that kind of heart when it comes to the church and the connection with those lost people. It can be easy with those who have a relationship outside from Jesus to recognize that there are people all around us. But yet, our responsibility is, well, well, I don't know why they aren't Christians, but maybe that's their choice. Or, well, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. It's not my problem. But the problem with that is, well, it's not the heart of God. And if we claim to be those followers of Jesus, we should have that kind heart that has God within us. 
And it's not just enough to recognize that there are people who are around us who are lost, but it has to matter to us at the same time. Remember, God's heart is that none should perish. We should have also have the same type of heart as the Apostle Paul had when he wrote the words in Romans saying that I speak the truth in Christ. He says, I'm not lying. My, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit and that the great grief and constant pain is in my heart, but indeed I would cut myself off from Christ if that would save my sisters and brothers. You see, Paul was so burdened that by the fact that of his brothers and sisters that his fellow Jews had not accepted Jesus. And he was filled with sorrow and that underlying grief that over them they were being lost. So I guess another question would become, what about you and I? Are we losing sleep over this who may be outside of that relationship with Jesus? Or is it still their choice? Do we care that we have neighbors that may be lost and destined? But through all this, Jesus continues to tell us that, again, he's the only way to get to God. Does it matter that we may have friends, even family, that are lost? And our hearts are filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief over those people in our families and even in our communities, all because they don't know Jesus. Because if not, that's probably an indication that we're not following Jesus properly ourselves. Because leaving the lost is exactly what Jesus did. Excuse me, loving the lost, not leaving the lost. A big faux pas there. But Jesus did exactly that. He loved the lost. He was called to do that. He called his followers to do the same. And that third element, in order to love the lost out there, we need to acknowledge the mandate that we have as Christians. If we're not going to love the lost, we're going to have to recognize that they are missing. And in the first place, it has to matter to us, and that we have to care that they are lost, and we have to acknowledge that if we're those followers of Jesus, that this is one of those boxes that is, are not optional. It's already checked off. We have that mandate as Christ followers to love the lost and the people who call themselves those followers of Christ and who never talk about Christ to the lost are somewhat oxymorons in my opinion. I'm just throwing that out there. But following Jesus means helping the people around us. To help them follow him as well and another example that we see in Matthew that I didn't have read this morning, it says that Jesus continued touring all of the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming that good news of God's reign and curing all kinds of diseases and sicknesses. And at the sight of those crowds, Jesus' heart was moved with pity because they were stressed and dejected. Like sheep without a shepherd, Jesus said to those disciples, This harvest is beautiful, but the laborers are few. Beg the overseers of the harvest to send laborers out to bring in the crops. In other words, what Jesus is saying to his disciples is that there is no shortage of lost people. They're all over the place. And you don't have to look far to find them, and that shortage of those who are willing to go after them. You see, to love the lost, we need to acknowledge the mandate we have as those followers of Jesus to be those workers, to be a part of that harvest in doing so. We know that Jesus clearly loved the lost because we see it throughout Scripture. And I want to lean towards one story, and I'm sure we've encountered it in Scripture many times. And of course, in our Gospel reading this morning in Luke, focusing on Zacchaeus, just to get the pronunciation correct. Um, but Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Now, if you've been to church for any period of time, and if you don't know about things that 
whenever I hear the name Zacchaeus, it sort of puts me in that mindset that we're dealing with this feeble old man. But when we think of Zacchaeus being that wee little man, we minimize who he really was. Because Zacchaeus wasn't this wee little old man, but rather this wicked old man. Believe it or not, Zacchaeus was despised and he was hated by his people. He was hated because he was the tax collector back in the day of Jesus and he aligned them, they aligned themselves with those depressive Roman governments and they, that they were sold out to people. They were sold out just so they could make a buck. And Zacchaeus, as that chief tax collector, sold a lot of people out. As we heard in the gospel lesson this morning, he started to become very rich. It's interesting to note that Zacchaeus was lost himself and he was living outside that will of God. But he was still drawn to Jesus. He still had that desire to glance at Jesus and to see what all that commotion was about as he passed through. And as you and I interact with people, there is that chance that we may be more interested in Jesus than any of us may think. There's a book out there that an author by the name of Tom, Tom Reinder wrote, and it was t it's titled The Unchurched Next Door. And in his book, he writes the following based off of this research. He says that, 82% of those who are unchurched are at least somewhat likely to attend a church if they are invited. I don't know about you, but it's kind of an interesting fact because I think we assume that if someone is lost, they want to be lost. And we're not just talking about inviting them to church, but <laughs> we're talking about introducing them to Jesus. And of course, we know that takes some steps in doing. I know many times we keep saying, oh, we should invite so-and-so to church. But we don't do it. And we heard in the gospel lesson this morning that as Jesus went by, he looked up and actually called Zacchaeus by name. And he tells him to come down quickly because he wanted to be a guest in his home. Now, we know that Jesus obviously was at an advantage and a being of God in the flesh, but he also knew Zacchaeus by name. Jesus actually called him out by name, and we see those examples throughout Scripture, and we need to keep in mind that Jesus didn't just see a crowd. He saw the people. He saw them as the followers of Jesus, and we have to remember, if we're not careful, that we can quickly develop this concept of us and them in our mentality. We need to note that, as we heard in Scripture, that Jesus went to Zacchaeus' home, something that we see Jesus do a lot throughout Scripture, but being with those who were <coughs> notorious for living lives that were not God-centered. He wasn't afraid of them. He didn't avoid them. In fact, he sought them out. Jesus pursued those who were lost. He wasn't afraid of what the people would think, and he wasn't afraid of what they would say. But he sought out those people, and of course, being lost can be messy. They come with excess baggage. They have social stigmas attached to them because their choices of where they come from and what makes other people whisper about them and shake their heads with disapproval. So who are you spending your time with that would make others grumble about you? Who's grumbling about you because you're spending time in proximity to the people who are notorious for their sins. Strangely enough, we've developed this culture as Christians of avoiding people, not wanting to be associated with those because the fear that they will drag us down 
and it will affect us in some shape or form. And what's further important to note that our faith is strong, so we're not pulled down by those people. We need to keep that strong faith so that doesn't happen. But we also heard Zacchaeus say in that gospel lesson this morning that here and now I give half of my belongings to the poor people. I've defrauded, if I've defrauded anybody, I'm going to pay them back four times that amount. Well, Zacchaeus was far from God. He has that encounter with Jesus, and the response to that was he repented. He turned his ways. He was committed to do whatever it made to do things right, and through that, he received that salvation in return. And with this encounter, Jesus reveals this purpose. He reveals from that leave of God of taking it on in flesh, being brought to walk on the earth, that a purpose is just as simple to seek and take care of those who are lost. That's what Jesus' purpose was. He didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. That was the entire point of his life, that if we were going to be those followers of Jesus and follow in those footsteps, that we have to do and be those followers and do what Jesus did. Maybe we should ask ourselves this question of, who is our Zacchaeus? Who is the one in our path that we cross who's far from Jesus? Who's in your life that you recognize that is missing from that family of God? And are you willing enough to point them towards Jesus? Who's your Zacharias? Who's your one? Part of the next step as we follow Jesus is helping someone else take their first step. All because Jesus seeked to set and serve those who were lost. Who's your Zacchaeus? Blessings upon each and every one of you this morning. Amen.